Hey, this is Dan Wunderlich from Defining Grace, and welcome to Art of the Sermon, a show for preachers, teachers, and communicators. My guest today is Mike McHarg, better known on the internet as Science Mike. He's a podcaster, host of Ask Science Mike, and co-host of the Liturgist podcast, and he's also a brand new author with his first book, Finding God in the Waves. How I Lost My Faith and Found It Again Through Science. Mike joins us today to talk about his book, as well as the relationship between science, doubt, and the Christian faith. Well, today my guest is Mike McHarg. You probably know him as Science Mike. He's a podcaster and an author. Mike, thank you so much for taking time to be here today. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Well, without giving away the entire first half of your new book, Finding God in the Waves, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your story, as well as the work that you do now? Sure. I am uh, just your conventional uh, boy meets God, boy decides God doesn't exist, (laughs) Um, boy has an overwhelmingly powerful mystical experience, which feels like standing directly in God's presence, Uh, boy believes he has a brain tumor, boy gets CAT scan, boy sees no brain tumor, so boy studies cosmology, quantum (laughs) physics, and neuroscience to understand who God may be. It's just your basic, normal American story. Like the last three Zach Braff movies, basically. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> just basically a rom-com. <laughs> That's awesome, and and uh, and it's it's an amazing story, and and I just want to start from the very beginning by saying, even those of you who are fans of Mike's podcast, and I'll get him to talk about it soon. Uh, even if you've heard him tell his story on those podcasts, uh, this book, Finding God in the Waves, is such an incredible. It's a, it's an expansion. It's a deeper look into the into your story. And there's even parts in the book where you say, this is a part of the story I haven't normally told before. And so I learned so much more about you, especially through the first half of the book, even though it was a story that I'd heard before. You gave different details and took a different perspective. Was it difficult to retell your story in a new way? Or was this sort of liberating to finally get to sort of put the whole thing down out on paper? It's my first book. So it was difficult just because I was learning to write a book. Uh, But it was totally liberating because, you know, on stage, 25 minutes to 55 minutes is usually what I have for my story talk when that's what I do. A podcast, maybe I get a luxury to go a little deeper sometimes, not always. But you have to cut out so many truly significant details, mainly the thoughts I was having as the experience happened, Mm. which always troubled me because... Uh, I thought that for someone who was in a state of very existential doubt, very destructive um, doubt that made them suffer, a peek behind the curtain might help them feel less alone, less crazy, less isolated. Yeah, absolutely. And it would also be more helpful for people who don't struggle with doubt themselves, but want to understand the people in their lives who they love, Mm -hmm. whose beliefs about God are changing, that deeper perspective can help you understand why it's a reasonable thing for someone to doubt that God is real or Jesus was God's son or any of these other things that are happening so much today. Uh, So that was incredibly liberating to have the space to go in and explore those topics with time and with care and with nuance. And plus, you know, the talk by necessity and time sort of ends on this climactic moment where I stand on the beach and that is not the end of my story. That's not right. a happily ever after moment. Yeah. And so in the second half of the book, I can go into things I've never really gone into at depth on podcasts, which is how I learned to approach the Christian faith through science. And so now for folks who maybe haven't heard your story before and aren't familiar with the work that you're doing now through podcasting and the liturgist touring and, and creating works, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing today? Well, everything I do, and it's spread all over, I do the Liturgist podcast with Michael Gunger. I have my own podcast called Ask Science Mike. I do a lot of live appearances, uh, sometimes, you know, usually five to eight a month, sometimes more. And then I also write for a lot of different publications like Relevant or Don Miller Storyline, um, Sojourners, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Everything I do is about one simple thing. And that's helping people reconcile their faith with modern science. That's, that's all I do. And that is born of necessity in my own life, learning to do that for myself and seeing how 
painful a journey that was and how lonely it was, especially for people that grew up in more conservative or more evangelical contexts, doubt can be a four-letter word. Mm. And so that's what all my work is about. That dovetails well into this next question, because you say, all I do is simply reconcile faith and science. Uh, But number one, that's not an easy thing to do necessarily. But number two, the way in which you explain science and and oftentimes touch on very complicated concepts, you do it in a way that is approachable and at least leaves me someone whose greatest scientific achievement is watching three entire seasons of Mythbusters. You you make (laughs) me feel like I understand what you're talking about. And, and, and are able to connect it with the faith journey that, that I, as a pastor, am living and guiding other people through. And even though this book, a lot of it is a memoir, it has a lot of science in it, but it's all engaging. So do you have a technique that you use for breaking down and explaining complicated things, or has it always sort of come natural for you? Oh, wow, that's a fantastic question. I mean, so the book, here, here, here's, I'll be honest. The narratives only exist as a vehicle to deliver the science information. Oh, that's interesting. (laughs) So I knew if I just, actually the first run of the book didn't have my story in it. Oh, wow. It was literally just a bunch of rhetoric and Mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. And uh, I loved it. And everyone who read it said it was super boring. (laughs) And that's when I started studying the science of storytelling. And I've always been a good storyteller. Frankly, if there's one thing Southern Baptists do well, it's teach people to tell their testimony. Yeah. Which uh, your testimony is your life story containing a sales pitch for Jesus. Uh, So that, that conditioning, I've taken that training and combined it with my years in advertising Mm -hmm. to know how to make complex information resonate with people. So if people are emotionally invested, they're paying attention. So I, I, I work hard at making things funny or poignant and engaging so that when I start talking about the relationship between creation theology and the initial singularity of the Big Bang Theory, mm. people still pay attention. They don't tune out. Yeah. Because I've, I work hard to use, to offset difficult words and concepts with very accessible, casual, conversational language. Uh, And I do, I have kind of distilled that to a system at this point. I don't know if I could do it justice in a podcast (laughs) answer. Uh, But I I literally have a multi-step process wherein, and I've done it so much, by the way. So one of the things I do that I love, probably my favorite thing that I do, is Ask Science Mike live events, where people come and ask me questions that I don't get ahead of time. And I've, I've worked this process to such detail that I can do it as people are asking the question oh, wow. Wow. and then offer them a composed answer in response. And, and that I'm so curious about that process because this strikes me as really what a lot of us as preachers have to do. You know, we've all heard the preachers that just sound like seminary professors kind of quoting the commentaries and telling you what all the word studies say, but the preachers that tend to engage us the most are the ones that can connect it to real life and connect it to a story and, and keep us invested. And And I, my undergraduate degree is actually in advertising as well, and I tell folks really what I learned is how to communicate with people. More than anything else, uh, it was how to communicate. So it, it doesn't surprise me, uh, having grown up Southern Baptist and spent spending time in advertising, that that would be one of your strengths. Every talk, every answer, every email, everything I do has a protagonist. Mm. And a, the protagonist has a goal. And either I'm the protagonist, or I tell a story with the protagonist, or I make the person who asked the question the protagonist. Uh, but I always make sure everything I do is scaffolded by a story structure. Uh, now, one of the people who does this better than anybody in the world is Don Miller in terms yeah. of mm-hmm. explaining it as a system. My my system's not completely similar to his, <laughs> but he's done a lot more work making his system accessible and trainable to other people. Awesome. And that's at uh, Storyline? Yeah, Storyline. He does Story Brand, which he's kind of shifted his focus away from like personal empowerment mm-hmm. towards institutional communications. Mm-hmm. But if you're a pastor... He, I, they've got an online course, I know, but the, his in-person workshops, you'll leave StoryBrand and you'll be able to 
give better sermons for sure. Yeah, he and he also has a new story brand podcast um, that is in the middle of the second season, and they work. Oh, I was through. on the first season of that. Uh, one. Yep, that's right, that's right. Uh, it's it's a great one. So that's certainly a resource for folks out there. And and you do answer science questions of all types on your podcast, Ask Science Mike. But you seem to have a particular affinity for the brain. So what is it about neuroscience that you find so fascinating? And are there any specific brain related topics from the book that you'd like to preview for listeners? Oh, wow. I love neuroscience because it's the only science where something studies itself. It's brains studying brains. And I think it's so useful because almost the entirety of the human experience emerges from our brains. So when you study the brain, it gives you these incredibly clarifying insights about why we feel the way we do, why we behave the way that we do, and ways you can change your behavior and your thoughts to get a desired outcome. Mm. So, for example, one thing in the book that I I really enjoyed is as I lost my faith and became an atheist, I encountered uh, a particular kind of atheist Sometimes they call themselves the new atheists or anti-theists. They're against religion. They don't just reject religion. They think everyone should. And uh, although they offer some pretty essential critiques of religion, it's brain science that most rigorously pushed back on the idea that religion is a harmful thing for human society or for individuals. Mm. Because it was in brain science that we're able to study the incredibly beneficial effects on the human brain when someone believes in a God that loves them. And that kind of clarity, that kind of rigorous scientific approach to faith encouraged me in my own faith practice. But more than that, because scientists have done the work of studying what happens to the brain, for example, when people pray, or what doubt looks like in the brain, we can offer prescriptive approaches, pragmatic techniques to have prayer give you the most cognitive and emotional benefit and better ways of dealing with doubt than treating it as a purely spiritual condition. And, and I was going to say for uh, this podcast, a lot of our listeners are pastors and preachers, small group leaders, ministry leaders, folks in seminary. If for nothing else, this book is worth uh, the price for your chapter on prayer and on your explanation uh, how and why different forms of prayer and different approaches to prayer work. You know, we all have sat through the small group study where we go through centering prayer or intercessory prayer, Lexio Divina, but you back it up with why exactly it works. And, and I think that that stuff is just so valuable to understand and, and adds a whole different, deeper meaning to understanding prayer. And I think this is why the church should support science. We shouldn't have an antagonist. Now, the Methodist church is not terribly antagonistic towards science, yeah, but, yeah. but many wings of the church are, and frankly, parts of the Methodist church are. Um, but what a gift we've been given by truly secular, in many cases, non-believing scientists who've gotten grants, used incredibly equi- expensive imaging equipment, put the world-leading expertise of neuroscientists to the problem and offered us these insights. Mm -hmm. I mean, more than anything to me, this, this cooperation between faith and neuroscience demonstrates the way that science and faith are not actually at odds. That's so great. And that, that leads to the next thing. I wanted to ask you about the the sort of historic and even contemporary tension between science and religion. And, and I'm sure that, that so much of it, especially now today in 21st century America, some of it is tied up into politics as well. But there always seems to be sort of this tension between science and religion. And, and just uh, a week before we're recording this, the Pew Research Center put out a new report uh, that looked at American religious trends. And one of the things they asked about was they asked the people who call themselves the nuns, the people without religious affiliation, what was sort of the main reason that led them uh, to become a non-religious person? And for a lot of them, the answer was science. And so for, for pastors who read that, see that headline, and it causes them them pain or trouble or concern because they feel like they or their church are open to science, do you have any words of encouragement for those pastors to help them understand this tension and, and what they can do about it? Yeah, Um With the right lens, science is your ally. 
whatever your beliefs are about creation or evolution, creating the space for people to engage those ideas inside of Christian faith and practice makes your church attractive. People leave church and the statistics tell us that the nuns are lonelier, Mm. that they're more isolated. And in fact, in the early days of leaving the church behind, you have a pretty significant elevated risk of suicide attempts because church offers really valuable community and connection. Um, And those are things that people are longing for. But if the church's stance on climate change or, or the Big Bang cosmology or evolution is absurd, uh, people are going to walk away because it seems as ridiculous as the, you know, centuries ago, the church's opposition to heliocentrism. Mm-hmm. The church's track record <laughs> of fighting <laughs> science on facts about reality is abysmal. Yeah. We're like, oh, for a million. <laughs> So I say when science speaks to facts about physical reality, let's let it. Let's get on board. And if it has theological implications, let's work through them without fear. Why do we so jealously guard our ideas about God, mistaking them for God himself? It's a just so grieves me that one of the biggest statistical predictors for a millennial-aged person to leave the church is that they accept the theory of evolution and their church does not. We have good resources, institutions like BioLogos, who do the work of working with real scientists and theologians to help create uh, accommodations for evolutionary creationism. In the main line, we have a a lot of scholarship around theistic evolution. Um, These are not necessarily battles. These are not good hills to die on. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's, it's a waste of energy. So let's focus on what's important, the hope we have in this story of Jesus to offer healing to the world and community for those who feel most alone. Mm. Well, and what I find really interesting about your work, and you can correct me if this is a wrong characterization of the community of folks that are drawn to you, but it's not just that folks identify with your story of of leaving the church behind, uh, either stopping there or then the folks that connect with your reconstruction, but simply your willingness to be open to science has drawn a lot of folks to you. And then what's interesting is is you talk about the spiritual dimension and the emotional dimension of of the experience of letting go of God or the church community because the church's view on reality and their own view of reality, they don't overlap. I guess what I'm trying to ask you is your openness to science has led people to you who then ask spiritual questions. And so I was wondering what are some of the most spiritual questions you get asked after people either hear your story or encounter your work? Oh, that's really good. First of all, the last two or three months, I've had a terrible progression in my work and that the questions have gotten increasingly unique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's harder to pick like one question that represents 200 others like it was earlier in the program. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's because people Netflix the series mm-hmm. and go back and listen to all of them and then they hear the answers to those common questions. I, I also think I shouldn't have a job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, If the church was doing a good job creating space for people, uh, I would have zero podcast downloads. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, the success of my work, and by the way, the the self-identified nuns are the majority of my audience. Uh, I have, you know, most weeks as many people who identify as atheists as evangelical listen to the show. And it is that openness, but it's not just the openness to science. There's a lot of science podcasts on the internet that are better than mine, Mm. who are led by smarter people. I could name dozens of (laughs) far, the the ones I listen to, right? But when they listen to those shows, any spiritual yearning or longing they would express is just as dismissed as science is when they listen to faith-based podcasts. So I think what my work does is 
uniquely remain open to the honest pursuit of truth. And without judgment, wherever, whatever way stations you end up at in your pursuit of truth, you will not be judged or shunned by me or my community. The one commandment in the Science Mike audience is thou shalt not bully different ideas. Mm. It's, it's, it's a no-go. If people are sarcastic, dismissive, you can discuss literally anything on my comment forum, but if it switches into a snide or dismissive tone, I, I have no problem deleting you and ultimately banning you. Uh, because I'm committed to people having the space to explore ideas and conversations. And sometimes that's messy. There's some issues where one person's honest expression can genuinely be hurtful to another person, at which point I try to call that out and have people try to be self-reflective. But I have much more room for that than people who would intentionally try to change someone else's beliefs or behavior through abuse. Yeah. Are there any questions that are unique to or come up more frequently from folks who either are or used to be pastors, preachers, or ministry leaders? Sure. You've had this amazing experience on the beach. How do you connect that with Jesus at all? Hmm. You've had this amazing experience on the beach. Why did that happen to you and not to me? Because I've been asking for it for 30 years. I'm an atheist and a pastor. How am I going to make this work without starving my family? Because I'm not trained for anything else. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's probably the three most common clergy questions. That, you know, based on my email inbox, there's a lot of pastors in this country who don't believe anymore or are really struggling. Uh, and they don't have a safe place to go. I mean, it's one thing for a congregant, but if it, think about it, even in the Methodist church, if a, if a pastor goes to their district superintendent or their bishop and says, look, I'm not sure I believe anymore, is that a safe move? And even if the most accommodating leadership is there, like what timetable do they have to return to some Methodist orthodoxy? Mm. It's an incredible risk. And so people feel isolated and somehow find me on Google. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, that ties into a part of your story where you talk about being um, at, the, at the church that you were at, the Southern Baptist Church, being a Sunday school teacher, being a deacon, serving uh, as you were an atheist— in, in some ways, it seemed to me, because you wanted to protect your family and you wanted to be for your girls the person your wife wanted you to be for your girls. And then as you started to reconnect faith and started to express points of view that were outside the orthodoxy of the church that you were in, um, you ended up leaving the church and you talk about it being this great sense of relief. Um, and I can imagine that it's a struggle for any pastor, especially someone who's drawing a paycheck from this job, do you find that, that folks are, are, are terrified of, of jumping into the sea of doubt and questioning because of its interconnectedness with their livelihood? Oh, absolutely. I think some of the people who most vocally criticize doubt or doctrinal differences are the ones who are terrified of their own. Mm. It really complicates things when your paycheck comes from your beliefs about God, which is something I'm tiptoeing into now. I, I'm in this weird position. Someone tweeted me and said I was a freelance internet pastor, which uh, made me laugh really hard. But then I sort of had this moment of, <laughs> whoa. Yeah. Um, because I am not a pastor. I'm not ordained. I don't lead a congregation. But there's a lot of people who look to me for spiritual guidance. Mm -hmm. And then some number of people donate to my podcast every month and that like pays for my health insurance and sometimes i'll find myself worrying about answering a question and how that might affect the people who donate to the show mm -hmm. and not only how it will affect them but how it will affect their actual donation and it turns it back around on me which isn't the healthiest uh pattern of thought but i disclose it on purpose i mean part of what i do is share my dirty laundry so other people realize they're not the only one with a laundry basket um, if you're a pastor listening right now and you feel like I have these questions, I'm afraid to address them, uh, but they just keep growing in your mind, they're not going to go away. Mm. 
at some point, your brain is going to do what brains do. It's going to search for certainty. We're addicted to it as a species. So better to figure out how to do that in a safe communal journey than wandering into the woods at night alone. Mm. To tie it directly to, to preaching, an act that a lot of our listeners uh, do, the stage or the platform or the pulpit are not necessarily the places to work out your doubt. It's a place to express it. I think there's incredible value when a congregation hears a pastor say, I don't know, or I have questions too, or I'm working through this. But is there a line where your responsibility as the leader to encourage and guide your congregation, is there a line between there and just coming up on stage and saying, I don't know about all of this? So I hate to do this, but I'm, I have to like punt that question because... I can't get around the fact that I'm not actually a pastor. Like, I take incredible delight in being laity. There's freedom I get because I'm not ordained and I'm not clergy that I can process things out loud and that if I do something solely for the sake of solidarity, that's fine. I don't have to provide resolution. I don't have to provide spiritual leadership. Ultimately, I'm just sort of cultivating this space. And that may be different than the shepherding call a pastor has. I don't uh, shepherd people just so much as make sure that there's like a nice field. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But once you're in the field, as long as you don't like attack another sheep, you're cool. (laughs) Uh, You don't have to walk over there. I don't care when you get a drink of water. And the, the shepherding call of a pastor, I think, probably has innately has some extra restrictions on it, but I can't say that with any conviction or authority. Mm. Well, I am a United Methodist pastor, and I've been asked by some of my friends and colleagues to ask you how and why you chose uh, to become a United Methodist. And I know your pastor, she's awesome, uh, so it could just be something super special about Pastor Betsy and Good Samaritan United Methodist Church, your local church. Uh, But is there something uh, beyond just uh, Betsy and the local congregation? Is there something about United Methodist theology or our approach to faith that's connected with you? When I first came back to faith, Um, I felt super lonely and isolated, and a group of people who were in that 50 people in the room when I sort of stood up and said, I don't believe in God anymore, kind of walked with me through that, and a majority of them were United Methodist pastors. Oh, wow. Dale Fredrickson, Sarah Heath, and Jeff Campbell, three Methodist pastors, and they never freaked out about anything I said or was processing. It's just, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm with you. How can I help? Phone calls, emails, Facebook messages, supportive, encouraging, never dogmatic, never corrective. So when it became time to search for a church, I listed out every Methodist church in the city of Tallahassee, and that's where I started my search. And they were mostly kind-hearted groupings of people much, much older than me. Mm. And, you know, I I don't want to be ageist, but I came from a multi-generational blended congregation, and there were some pretty gray rooms uh, in the Methodist churches I tried. So I tried a couple of, like, hip evangelical churches, (laughs) and, you know, I I felt more comfortable with the evangelical liturgy, Mm -hmm. but the theology really rubbed me the wrong way. I found one church that had a really thoughtful, historically grounded pastor. I really appreciate, probably due to their uh, relative rarity, really dialed in, historically aware, evangelical and Pentecostal pastors are amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they like proclaim these things, but they understand its historical context. Uh, but ultimately, I didn't feel comfortable anywhere, and a friend told me, go to this place, Good Samaritan. Well, when I had gone to the United Methodist website, Good Samaritan wasn't even on there. So I was like, that that can't be a real Methodist church. The (laughs) Methodists don't even know about it. And sure enough, I went, and it was upstairs above a daycare. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like, they just meet in a room above a daycare. Uh, This is not a real church. Super small. And I walked in, and... It was really diverse. There were old people and young people and middle-aged people and families and single people. And there were different races and ethnicities. 
and everybody just seemed really accommodating and gracious together. And then the pastor came up, and a relative rarity in Tallahassee, the pastor was a woman. And for someone who struggles with the kind of patriarchal tradition of Christianity, uh, boy, that's a big plus. And then when Betsy started to preach, and it was just she kind of, with beauty, articulated matters of the heart. So evocative, so thoughtful. I just, I fell in love with the church. And so we kept going. And then we started to learn about Methodist uh, doctrine in specific. Uh, I found, found prevenient grace to be really compelling. But if there was anything that like sold me on Methodism, it was the quadrilateral. Mm. Because the Baptist church is unilateral. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that freedom to allow reason and experience to inform tradition and scripture, I found to be more intellectually grounded and honest. So as I've been a Methodist longer, I've actually, it started with friends that led to an appreciation of one specific congregation, but I've actually grown to appreciate not just my church, but the United Methodist Church. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. I know a lot of uh, folks in our audience are going to be really encouraged by that. Well, we have a set of questions that we like to ask all of our guests. And the first one is, what has been one of the most difficult topics for you to prepare or speak on and why? Uh, or you can answer one or both. Do you have any favorite experiences from podcasting and speaking? It's probably the same one. Forefront Church in Manhattan asked me to come talk about sex and addiction which I'd kind of touched on in my After Dark episodes, but this was like on stage in New York. Mm. So will anyone show up? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if they do, will they think what I have to say is crazy? So completely sold out room in Manhattan during Fashion Week. Like unbelievable. Gotta be one of my favorite experiences I've ever had on stage but also one of the most difficult talks I've ever had to prepare. So it's the same experience. Mm. Uh, you know, are people who are even vaguely Christ-leaning ready to hear what science truly has to say about sex and sexual ethics and addiction? Because even among progressive Christians, some of the truisms thrown around just don't have a lot of scientific basis. And uh, it was, especially when we got to the Q&A, just a dynamite experience that I was terrified of, which is the pattern of my work. The things I'm scared of the most tend to be the most rewarding, ultimately. Who have been some of the most impactful preachers and or communicators in your life and why? Uh, this is going to be hard to narrow down. I got to start with Rob Bell. Before I knew Rob, Velvet Elvis was like a life raft. And then once I got to know Rob, his commitment to create space and grace for people it is phenomenal. And his commitment to communicating things in a punchy, exciting way, I really think is important. I think Richard Rohr has shown me a lot of the value of contemplation and mysticism that's more grounded in church tradition. The Reverend Broderick Greer on intersectional justice has blown my mind and influenced me uh, tremendously. And it's not just his talks on justice, his theology through the lens of liberation really brings the gospel to life for me. Yeah, that's, those are three good ones. <laughs> Sounds good. In, in the book, you mentioned learning from stand-up comedians how to sort of communicate and be funny and be more, um, I guess, loose socially. Are there any uh, comedians in particular that you're a fan of and, and, and influenced you either then or now? Oh, man, totally different lists. Uh, <laughs> then... Uh, Mitch Hedberg. Yeah. He was, his timing, his use of absurdity was huge for me. Um, Pete Holmes is a genius. Uh, Hannibal Buress. Amy Schumer, like her just rampant disregard of taboo is quite beautiful. Aziz is amazing. That's probably, that's probably my, my go-tos. Sounds good. Uh, you mentioned Velvet Elvis. Are there any books that have been influential either uh, to the work that you do or to your process of communicating? Oh, my gosh. I hate the book question. I read six to eight a month. <laughs> yeah. so, so what are you reading right now? How about that? 
what am I reading right now? The Divine Dance by Richard Rohr. Uh, the Road Back to You by Ian Cron and Suzanne Stabile. Uh, the Day the Revolution Began by N.T. Wright. Uh, the Anxiety and Phobia Workbook. How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain. And The Happiness Hypothesis is what I'm reading right now. Sounds good. Are you a physical book guy or a Kindle guy? Uh, I was a Kindle guy, and yeah, it's funny. I was a book guy, went Kindle, and now I've gone back to books. I was a faith guy, went atheist, now I went back to faith. <laughs> there um, <you> go. <laughs> the Kindle travels well, but it just get, distills everything down to information in my brain, and I have no context for where I learned it. So someone will say, oh, where'd you read that? And I go, um, and I have to like, go to my Kindle and search and try to figure it out. And books use your spatial and tactile memory in a way that Kindle does not. You associate ideas with an object, with a cover, and a physical space. And I've found that improves my retention. So they're a pain to travel with, but I love them. That's amazing. I have that experience with podcasts. I will spout something and people say, where did you learn that? And I, I say, I don't know which podcast it was, but I can tell you where I was when I was listening to it. Right. Your brain goes, oh, the iPhone told me. It doesn't go which podcast. Right. So um, if pastors want to learn more and keep up with what's going on in the world of science, you mentioned BioLogos. You also said that there were some science podcasts you follow. Are there any resources that you would recommend that are approachable, obviously, other than Ask Science Mike? Minute Physics is phenomenal. Oh, uh, boy. You know, I've got, it's, now we're back in digital, so it just comes out of the machine <laughs> sure. and I subscribe. Sure. Follow the work of Andrew Newberg if you want to learn about God and the brain. Uh, read all the books he's put out and and get notified on Amazon when he puts new ones out. He's incredible. Vsauce is really good on YouTube. Uh, Invisibilia tends to do pretty interesting things. They might wander a little out of science orthodoxy in pursuit of a good story sometimes, so be yeah. aware of that. Yeah. Um, but, but as long as you're going to go and use them just as a direction of where it'll do for the research, they're a lot of fun. Um, yeah, those are good ones. Awesome. And then finally, just for all of our listeners, I cannot commend Mike's book to you high enough. Is there anything else that you wanted to share or say about the book? Uh, when this podcast comes out on the 15th, the book will already be available. Is there anything else about the book that you'd like to share or let our listeners know ways that they can follow your work and get in touch? You can learn all about the book at findinggodinthewaves.com. So if you're like, what is this book about? I've got a series of videos on there you can view that'll take you through some of the topics and the things we discuss. And you can learn more about the book as well as find places to buy it. Uh, and I'd love to see you. I'm heading out on tour. So if you go to that same website and click the book tour button, you can see if I'll be in a city near you. And I'd love to meet you and talk to you about where you are with God and the questions that you have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. And where can uh, listeners find you on social media? My name is really hard to spell. So probably the easiest thing to do is go to AskScienceMike.com. And scroll to the bottom of the page, and there's, there's links to all my social sites there. Awesome. Mike, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Grace and peace. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Art of the Sermon. You can find show notes, including links to some of the things that we talked about at artofthesermon.com. As always, I would love to hear what you think about the show, and I want your input to be a part of the conversation. So you can connect with me through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, all at username Art of the Sermon. If you'd like to support the show, I would encourage you to subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play Music, or your favorite podcast app so that new episodes are downloaded as soon as they're live. And of course, in addition to sharing the show with your friends, the best way to help us out is to leave a review in the iTunes store. This lets iTunes know that you care about the show and want other people to find it. Thank you again so much for joining me, and I'll catch you next time on Art of the Sermon.